it's incredibly hot outside but we're not here to talk about the weather we're here because it's this time of the year again no not this time this time of the year This release is a beast. There's no way we can cover all the features in a few minutes, so I'm just going to go through the stuff I think are most exciting. But if you absolutely need to know all the new features, here they are. Cue dramatic music. What, too fast? <laughs> Don't worry, we're gonna cover the most exciting ones. The first one has to be MoGraph. This is one of the bigger MoGraph updates of the last few years, and it opens up a whole world of possibilities. The idea here is really simple. The falloffs are now decoupled from the effectors, and they now have their own little space under the Create menu. How is that any good? Let's take this super simple example. We have our cloner set up here and three effectors. One is responsible for the rotation, the other one for scale and color, and finally, the third one gives us a little bit of an extra rotation. Before R20, if we wanted to fade this effect in and out, we would have to go inside each of these effectors and dial in the same linear field values three times. On top of that, if we wanted to animate the effect, we would end up with three tracks for each falloff. This makes things more complicated than they need to be, especially when changes from the client would come up. In R20, we can create one linear field and all of the effectors can share the same field, simplifying things tremendously. Where things get really interesting is that we're not limited on using just one field for each effector. We can stack them up to create unique effects. With this layer-based approach, just by adjusting the blending modes, we can get vastly different results. Let's see it in action again in a really simple example. We have this simple grid of cubes that has a plane effector applied to it. The only thing the effector does is move the cubes by 50 centimeters on the Y axis. Now, if we apply a formula field, our cubes will start moving between 0, which was the position of the cubes before the plane effector was applied, and 50 after the plane effector was applied. Now, let's say we don't want the area in the middle to be affected by the movement. We can create another field, and we can set it to subtract. Or let's say we want to have the maximum height and have the cubes in this area colored differently. We can do that easily by just changing the blending mode to max, and then switching the color mode to color. Of course, by changing the opacity, we can control how strong the effect can be in that area. We can also control if we want the color data to show through, or just the movement. Now, by stacking other fields on top, we can start adding to the effect and very easily our director setup. The amount of stuff we can do just by blending things together is crazy. The fields don't only apply to MoGraph, they can be used wherever we have falloffs. In this example, we have a bulge deformer squashing the cube but then we can get more creative in order to get unpredictable results. So I've applied here a random field with an animating noise, and on top of that some spherical fields that try to bring the original shape back into place. Of course, we can move things around and also animate them until we get the result we want. Pretty cool stuff! Finally, we can create complex growth effects by using vertex maps in combination with fields. Here, we affect the vertex map of our landscape object by dragging our sphere into the fields area. Every time the sphere hits the landscape, the vertex map is changing. Now, if we change the mode of the base layer from None to Grow, we can get an expanding effect on the vertex map. Of course, we can control this to get exactly the result we want. Now that we have this vertex map, we can affect how the landscape looks by using a displacer and the vertex map we created. So now all we need to do is drag the vertex map into the falloff of the displacer, and our landscape is changing wherever the ball hits.
So now if we apply the same logic to the materials, we can create a more complex effect with the geometry and the materials changing. These examples just barely scratch the surface, but it's just a small showcase of what you can do with fields. I think in the next few months when more people start using them, we will see some crazy setups. Now let's move on to another great feature of R20, and that's VDBs. VDBs in Cinema must be the most fun implementation out there. I must have spent countless hours messing around with all the different options and filters. But first things first. What can you do with uh, VDBs? The simple explanation is you build volumes. <laughs> Building volumes is the simplest thing ever. Let's take this simple example here. A cube and a sphere. We want to create a new volume out of these two objects. To create VDBs in Cinema, we need two generators, the Volume Builder and the Volume Mesher. Let's grab the Volume Builder. In typical Cinema fashion, all we need to do is make our objects children of the Volume Builder. To complete the process and to create the actual volume, we then make the Volume Builder the child of the Mesher. Now our objects are joined together. If we go into the Builder's settings, you will notice that we have a nice layering system where we can combine objects together. If we choose to do so, we can subtract for example the sphere and get a new shape. Everything is still live so we can freely move the objects around and reach the look we'd like. We can also add filters to further modify the effect. VDBs are deeply integrated into Cinema, so we can basically use VDBs with everything. We can use splines, MoGraph, even particles. As you can imagine, the amount of possibilities is just through the roof. Let's see though a more practical example than this mess here. This model is done entirely with VDBs. And as you can see, it's still in a procedural state, so we can still adjust things according to our liking. Let's see it in more detail. Our screw is made out of seven objects. The oil tank, which makes for the screw head, then two cylinders with taper deformers for the top part of the screw, and another cylinder again with a taper deformer for the rest of the body. The actual threads of the screw are done with a helix object and a bunch of deformers, like bulge and FFD. Now, if I start enabling the objects one by one in the volume builder, you will see the final object taking form. Most importantly, everything is still live, so I can keep modifying my object until I'm satisfied. Of course, we can also use fields inside VDBs, either as volumes themselves or as a way to control the overall effect. Here, for example, we have a piece of eroded text, which is super simple to create. All I did was drag a piece of MoGraph text inside the Volume Builder and then use a reshape filter to create the eroded effect. The secret here is the fact that we can control the filter through the use of fields. So let me delete this filter and let's rebuild it together. Let's add the reshape filter to start building the erosion. I will choose the reshape layer here and then set it to dilate erode. Positive values will dilate the object, and negative will erode it. Let's do minus 5. Now I want to add some random noise to my filter. To do that, we will go under Fields, and then add a random field. Let's choose an appropriate noise, and also adjust the scale of the noise a little bit. The noise is now applied everywhere, but we only need it in a few parts. So to control the area of influence, we will create a linear field, position it accordingly, and then set it on subtract mode. Now the only thing we need to do is move things around and adjust values until satisfied. And again, just to repeat myself, everything is still live, so I can go ahead and current my text exactly how I want to, or for example adjust the random deformer. As mentioned before, we can also use MoGraph with VDBs. 
We can create all sorts of weird things with this combination. These are nothing else other than a MoGraph cloner and a bunch of filters. It couldn't be any simpler than that. I could easily spend hours talking about all the possibilities VDBs offer, but we have more stuff to cover. In R20, we have the possibility to create materials by using nodes. They use the reflectance channel approach, so if you're not familiar with it, you can check the video in the card above. Nodes show their power when you have a shader or texture that needs to be used in several areas of your material. In this simplified example, we have a noise that is used in a diffuse layer and in the alpha channel. Before, if we had to change this shader, we would have to go into all the areas it was applied to and input the same values multiple times. This can be very tedious, especially if the material is complex. Now all we need to do is just adjust this shader once and we're all set. Of course, the regular materials are still there, so we can still use whatever is more convenient. In the Create menu, in the Material Manager, we can choose between node-based materials, the regular material, and we also have one more new option here. This is the Uber material, which is basically a nodal-based material, but with everything set up and ready to use. It uses three reflectance layers, one for the diffuse base, one for reflection, and another one for coding. In a lot of cases, it's a more simplified UI than the wealth of options in the reflectance channel. Nodes no doubt will be helpful to bigger size studios since they offer a lot of advanced features like creating and storing assets document and application wide. And there's also support for versioning. Versioning allows us to go back several versions and also update to a new version of our asset when that becomes available. For example, from uh, another member of the team working on the project. Nodes, VDBs, and fields are the main headline features of R20, but there are a ton of other features. One that comes to mind is multi-instances. It's basically a set of different viewing options for instances in the viewport. It might not seem like a big deal, but it makes a ton of difference when the scene you're working on is quite complex. It can speed up scene navigation quite significantly. Let's take this scene for example. Without the multi-instance option enabled, the navigation is quite choppy and adjustments can take a long time. But if we switch to multi-instances, and in this case point mode, we get back all the speed we lost while also having a good idea of what the scene looks like. And since the multi-instance setting is object-based, we can set a higher detail in the area we're working on and set the simplest display option on everything else. This scene would be a chore to do in R19 and earlier, and as a result the final quality would suffer. With R20 I could just push the details to the extreme because I knew the system could handle it. The content browser is also updated in R20 with lots of different assets, from models to scenes and materials. There's some beautiful stuff in there, so be sure to check out all the libraries. It's 10 gigabytes worth of data, so you're bound to find something you like. There are still a ton of other features I haven't covered, like subsurface scattering and ProRender, along with support for motion blur and out-of-core texture handling, which allows for rendering scenes that don't fit into the GPU memory. ProRender also gained multi-passes, which help a lot when it comes to compositing. There are also workflow improvements for motion tracking, multi-passes for PBR-based renders in a physical render, a great CAD importer, and a ton of other small uh, refinements in the UI. It's a big release and you can easily waste hours and hours just by messing around with all the new features. Let me know in the comments below if you have any questions and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to do all the YouTube stuff like subscribing, bells and likes and I'll see you on the next one.